Hello everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Securing DevOps podcast, show and tell podcast, mostly show and tell. I think that's how we call it uh, these days. Um, and I'm doing it solo this uh, this time around for this episode of SOPS. And the reason I'm doing it solo is because, well, this is kind of my tool. Um, I say my tool, but it's no longer my tool. It used to be, but nowadays uh, I mostly don't write a whole lot of code on it. And it's the amazing Adrian Utrilla in the ops team uh, who maintains the tool and does most of the work. So uh, thank you to him for, and also an amazing community of contributors. I, I have to mention these guys as well. But anyways, uh, I've noticed that a lot of people have questions around secrets management as a whole. And I do talk about it a little bit in the book, but obviously I didn't get into the details of how you use a tool like SOPS. Uh, in the few paragraphs that I uh, dedicated to it in the book. So this is the right medium for it. And I'm going to go through uh, how you use SOPS for basic things, like just encrypting and configuration file uh, with a PGP key. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the bootstrapping of trust uh, problem that you have when you provision infrastructure servers and how you solve that in environments like AWS and GCP. And we're actually going to create KMS in AWS and GCP and uh, use them with SOPS. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you manage SOPS file, uh, SOPS encrypted files in Git. And uh, and that's it. We're going to give an overview of how you use the tool in practice. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to shrink this because you probably don't want to see me in full screen the whole time. So this, this should do. This should be fine. Uh, and SOPS, SOPS is a fully open source project. It's was started, I want to say, three and a half years ago uh, because we simply had a need for uh, a better secrets management tool at Mozilla. And uh, we were uh, focused on AWS at the time and we really wanted to have a way to distribute secrets to instances that didn't require copying and maintaining uh, clear text files around. And that's why SOPS came to be. Uh, the main idea with SOPS is that you will manage your uh, YAML files or JSON file or whatever in a Git repository, and you will push those encrypted files up to some storage environment where your production systems will retrieve them from, and the production systems themselves will be decrypting the files and loading the configuration. So there's really no clear text data lying around other than uh, on the production systems themselves. Uh, SOPS is, uh, well, was originally written in Python back in the day, uh, and then we wrote it in Go uh, because it's just a lot easier to ship uh, Go tools to a large number of you know uh, various operating systems that use very different uh, configurations, whereas Python you have to worry about a lot more stuff and it breaks a lot more often. So Go is nice for that. Uh, and, and SOPS is really just a command line tool, but you can also use it as a library. Uh, if you're writing other Go application. And actually, I might talk a little bit about that uh, and show how we use it in Autograph, which is a server that um, signs Firefox. So here we go. Uh, SOPS, when you have it installed, uh, just gives you a very simple SOPS command line with, with a pretty massive help here that I'm not going to read. But uh, what you can right away do is, for example, if you dump uh, your... PGP key, right? You want your fingerprint, so I'm going to grab mine here. Uh, and uh, we want to right away create a file uh, that is encrypted with SOPS. So let's grab, uh, let me echo that and remove the spaces here. Okay. And now we're going to use that fingerprint to create a new file with SOPS. All right, we'll call it pgpfile.yaml. And we want to give it the PGP fingerprint to use to encrypt that file. So here we go. And SOPS under the hood will use the PGP key and will drop us into a new file that has a little bit of a template. This is a YAML file here. Um, and so these just demonstrate the type of structure you can use in a source file, which is really just a basic YAML file. So we can get rid of that and uh, we'll simply create a simple key and value foo bar. All right, escape WQ to save that. And then there's a hood, uh, SOPS validates a YAML structure and we'll encrypt the file uh, with the PGP, there you go, public key. So what we find here 
is our key foo and instead of the value bar we have a an encrypted string here that follows a specific syntax and what that tells us is that we have an encrypted envelope here with an opening bracket and a closing bracket at the end and we have an, an algorithm here so aes 256 gcm and our data uh, is uh, is just this this four uh, base64 encoded uh, string we find an initialization vector here and a tag and we find the type of the value which was a string so str now what's interesting here is this data string when sops saved the file um, when sops first generated the file since it was a new file it created a data key for that file and it used that data key to encrypt the value bar uh, using the algorithm AES two fifty six GCM. Now that data key obviously is is extremely important, and you will need it to retrieve uh, the clear text version of the file. And what SOPS did is that it encrypted that data key with the PGP uh, public key. Uh, in this case, my PGP public key, such that I need the corresponding PGP private key in order to decrypt this PGP message here and retrieve the data key of the document and then decrypt that string and, and recover my original file. Whoops, sorry about that. Now, if I just type uh, sops pgp file.yaml here, it will do all of that under the hood, access my private key, retrieve the data key, decrypt the encrypted value, and I get back my original YAML file. And that's basically how SOPS works under the hood. It's always the same mechanism of generating a key for the document and using that key to encrypt all of the values in the document. Now, one thing we noticed is that uh, SOPS itself does not encrypt when you have a key value document like a YAML document, it doesn't encrypt the key. It actually does not encrypt anything else but the value. Even if you have multiple layers of nesting, for example, we can do bar baz hello. And we save that and we look at the encrypted version on disk. We can see that foo bar baz are in clear text. It's really just a value at the end that is encrypted. And that is by design because what we really wanted with SOPS is a way to protect configuration variables. But we want to keep the uh, keys themselves in clear text. So I'm talking about document keys here, not the encryption keys. Um, in order to be able to look at those files without decrypting them and understand what they have in them. But the other benefit of it is that if we store those in Git, so I'm going to initialize a, a Git uh, repository here, and I'm going to add this file to it, and I'm going to commit it. Okay. Then I'm going to make a change to it with subs, and I'm going to add a new value. So, for example, I want my monitoring key in there. So we're going to do that. We're going to add a monitoring key. Monitoring key. All right, and we save that. Then what I get is obviously an encrypted file, but the git diff here shows that the base structure of the document has not changed. We only added this new value to the YAML file. The, uh, the document also has uh, a Mac, a message access control that hashes and guarantees the integrity uh, of the structure of the document. And obviously, when you modify that file, that Mac is going to change, which is what we see below. And we see the last modified date, and we see a Mac. Now, this is extremely useful if you're working uh, in a team and people modify files uh, throughout the day, and you end up with potentially conflicts uh, on those files if two people modify them at the same time. If you're using a traditional technique like uh, PGP encrypted files, what you really get uh, is, in a, is an encrypted blob, a binary blob, and you cannot do any sort of gif diff uh, or, or merge commits on them. Uh, SOPS allows you to do this, obviously, at the cost of keeping some parts of your document in clear text, in this case, the structure of the document itself. 
So this tool is really focused on uh, operational need, right? Infrastructure management. You wouldn't want to use this for private conversations because it leaks too much metadata. Um, now, what's really interesting about SOPs, the PGP one is easy to demonstrate locally, but you don't really want to use that in production. Why? Because if you start using PGP keys to encrypt your configuration files and ship them over to production servers, it means you need to have PGP keys on the production servers themselves. And then you have a chicken and egg problem, uh, or also called a bootstrapping of trust problems, where in order to decrypt those files, you need to have the PGP key on them. Well, how do you get the PGP key on the server? Uh, that's pretty much impossible. You need to have a way, either you need to bake your PGP key in the AMI, or someone has to go in and put that PGP key in the AMI itself. And that's extremely inconvenient, right? At that point, if someone has to go in and put that key on the system, that same person might as well just put directly the configuration file and bypass the entire secret provisioning process. It's easier, it's safer. Um, so that bootstrapping of trust problem really uh, states that, yeah, only have two ways uh, to, to manage that initial trust in instances or in system. The first one is to have a human being uh, establish that initial trust. System comes online, a human being says, I trust that system and I'm going to allow it to connect to the rest of the provisioning infrastructure. That's basically what you do when you have a puppet infrastructure and each new agent that comes online has to be approved by a sysadmin before they can really get all the manifests and everything. Uh, obviously, if you have an AWS auto-scaling infrastructure that creates new systems all the time, that's extremely inconvenient. You can't have someone at 2 a.m. sitting there approving each new instance that gets brought up into the auto-scaling group. So for that, AWS and GCP and, and cloud providers in general have their own access control model in the IAM that basically uh, authenticate the new systems that come online, give them an identity or role, and you can use that role to then further give access to the instance and trust it inside your infrastructure. In an EC2 instance world, for example, that's an IAM role that you give to the EC2 instance. You say, well, that instance will have the role application X, and then you can give access to a bunch of resources to role for application X. In the case of SOPs, the way we use this is we say, we will create a KMS key, and we will allow application X to decrypt using the KMS. And that way, when the instances get encrypted files, they will use a role to call the KMS, decrypt the encrypted files, and there's no manual provisioning done here. It's all managed by the access control role model of Amazon. Now, for that, obviously, uh, you need to have a KMS. So let's take a look quickly at how you create a KMS. In so AWS. here we are in the AWS management console in AWS, and I'm in uh, US East one, but this is mostly relevant for, uh, for it. You can do that in any region. And you see that AWS has a key management service here. So we're gonna code into that, and it will drop us into this UI where we can uh, create a key. And this is a very simple process. I'm gonna call the key subs demo 2019-0301, and description subs demo and create a key here, we don't care about tags, uh, and we're gonna give a user administration right and users right to the key. And that's basically it. We finish it, uh, it's done, we have a KMS key created, so super simple. There's really not much to it. If we click on it, we see a little bit uh, more information about it. So AWS lets you set key policies and key rotation schedules, et cetera. It's all managed under the hood, right? Really what this is, is, a, is an HSM. It's a hardware security module that dropped you an AES uh, 256 key. You can access it using, using this ARN. Uh, and this is what we're going to need to uh, encrypt our file. And instead of using PGP on the command line here, we're going to do SOPS uh, AWS file.yaml, right? And the argument we're going to give is dash dash KMS and the ARN of the key. Now I'm going to remove those spaces. And what happens under the hood is that obviously I have my account uh, configured here with my uh, AWS access key and secret key to access that KMS, right, like you would in any AWS command line tool. And it gives us exactly the same uh, welcome structure that we had before. Now, we're gonna delete those lines. Um, K 
Okay. And we're going to do the same foo bar that we had before and save it. And uh, the same thing happens under the hood. And what we're going to see in the file is that we have exactly the same structure for foo and the encrypted value bar. But what changed here is that instead of having the PGP section in the SOPS metadata, we now have a KMS section here that has the R of our key and it has an encrypted uh, value that is essentially the data key that was generated locally by SOPS to encrypt the, the, the value bar. Uh, the data key has been encrypted with the AWS KMS. Now, in order to do that, SOPS called the AWS API uh, and, and asked it, well, here's a value, a data key that I created. Could you please encrypt it with the KMS that is located at this ARN? And AWS performed that operation and returned the encrypted data that we see here in the SOPS metadata, right? That's a base 64. Um, you could decrypt it yourself, but it wouldn't make any sense because it's basically Amazon secret sauce in here. Uh, we never see the key that Amazon used uh, to encrypt that value. In fact, uh, nobody can access it because it's stored directly inside a chip in a hardware security module. That's the value provided by AWS. They manage that infrastructure for us. What we can do, however, is to create uh, IAM roles that have permission to encrypt or decrypt uh, using that key so that we could give an instant an instance an easy to instance permission to essentially decrypt that value using their instance role and that's super useful for provisioning so then we can just take this and for example put it in an s3 bucket it's it's fairly encrypted it's very secure and have the instance download the encrypted file and decrypted locally using the sops command line tool for example uh, we can do something similar uh, in gcp uh, and here again i'm going to skip over the local setup uh, of your GCP console. Uh, but the ID is basically the same. Uh, we can go in here. So I have a, a demo project created here and this is not where I wanna go. I want to do open search and search for KMS in here. And it's going to drop me into GCP cryptographic key. And same principle, a little bit of a different interface and different terms for GCP. Uh, but we can basically create here uh, a keyring, right? I will create a new one actually, so we see it. I'm going to call my keyring uh, subs demo 2019-0301. Keyring location is global. Create it, okay? And once I'm inside my keyring here, uh, I can create a key. Uh, so I'm going to call it subs key one, for example. There are multiple key types, right? Here we want a symmetric key. So same as we had with KMS, but you can also use asymmetric sign and decrypt uh, in, in GCP, which uh, you do not have in AWS. And, and GCP here is going to uh, automatically rotate the key every 90 days. Again, it's their secret sauce. There we go, we create this, all right? And it will drop us into the key, it says it's available. We can copy the resource ID of the key and on the subs command line, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to give it the GCP KMS uh, resource ID, right? So it's a little bit different than AWS. GCP has a different way of uh, specifying an ID. It's more like a path. And I'm going to create GCP file.yaml. And here, under the hood, the same thing happens as with the other two. Uh, SOPS creates a data key and go and create that data key with GCP KMS. All right, so we're going to create our same old foo bar key value. And when we look at the GCP file.yaml, we see the same thing we saw before, GCP KMS resource ID and the encrypted data key here. So the same model applies. Uh, we also have Azure support, but I don't actually have an Azure account. That's a contribution that was done by uh, people who use Azure, uh, subs with Azure. Um, so I can demo Azure, but the same principle works in Azure. Now, the one thing that I wanted to show here uh, is that this is great. You can fit that into your environment. If you use Kubernetes, there are ways to integrate it with Kubernetes secrets, et cetera, et cetera. You can do a lot of cool stuff with it. It's a bit tedious uh, to always repeat your, your key IDs, et cetera. So one feature that uh, I found that people don't use enough is the sops.yaml configuration file. So I thought I would actually uh, demo that. Uh, we have 
using subs.yaml to configure. And what you can do with this is that uh, if you have a Git repository uh, that you use to store your uh, configuration secrets, you can drop a subs.yaml at the, the, the root of your repository and you can set creation rules in that subs.yaml to automatically pick the keys um, that are used to encrypt your files. So we're going to do that together. I'm going to take a template here. No, no not like that. Set paste. There you go. And I'm going to remove this and we're going to say everything that's that ends in .dev.yaml. Okay, that's a regex here. Uh, we'll use, uh, we're going to get rid of those two and we're going to create new one. So KMS is going to be the one that we just created in AWS here. Okay. And GCP KMS, if I remember correctly, yeah, GCP under KMS is going to be the one that we created in GCP. And we can also put our PGP key in there too. So, tick. And what I like to do um, is to have at least, uh, if, you're, if you're mostly focused on AWS, have at least two KMS to encrypt your files and a PGP to backup, right? You should create a PGP key and you should put that key on the USB stick, for example, uh, with a passphrase and put that in a safe in your office, somewhere secure. And uh, you should only have the public key available on your machine and put that public key fingerprint inside of your subs.yaml such that every file is encrypted with the KMS that are online but also with that GPG key that is stored safely in your safe. That's a backup solution, right? If you lose your AWS account, uh, you can always go back to that key that's in your safe and use a private key that's on it to decrypt all of your configuration files. You don't want to lose those. And it's always good to have a cold backup. Now, of course, don't do that with a key that's stored uh, somewhere unsafe or without a password or everything, right? Be reasonable, use a good way to, a good place to store that key long-term. Um, and, and Verify your backups every once in a while because that, that happens to you. Um, so we're going to add that PGP fingerprint. And so with that in place, every time you create a file that is called .dev.yaml, it will pick up the KMS from AWS, the KMS from GCP, and the PGP uh, key that we have locally. And it will use all three to encrypt the data key of the file. Now I'm going to close this and I'm create a new file and we're going to call it uh, demo.dev.yaml here. So when I create my demo.dev.yaml, you'll see it takes a little bit longer because it actually needs to reach out to AWS and to GCP and to my local PGP key. And then it drops us into the same old uh, template that we have for everything. So we're going to do the same thing we've been doing and we create foo bar and we save it and exit and then once we look at the demo.dev.yaml we see that we have a lot more metadata so we have that foo bar here but everything else here is metadata so let's unpack that a little bit we have our kms from aws and the data key is encrypted with a kms we have a gcp kms the same thing data key is encrypted with a gcp kms uh, nothing for you sorry guys i should do it as Azure next time. And we have our PGP one here. Now, there's a single data key for the document, right? And that single data key has been encrypted with all three methods. So any one of those three methods can decrypt the document. That's important, right? You can also, and I won't get into that now, but if you're interested in doing um, secret splitting, secret sharing, SOPS has a way to use Shamir secret sharing, but that's a little bit more of an advanced topic and you probably don't want to do that right away, right? If you're, if you're at that stage, uh, then ping me and we can talk. Um, but what you really want to do here is essentially create this subs.yaml file uh, 
in at the root of your environment and you can have a lot more rules in there maybe you have production file maybe you have per application keys etc it's very flexible and you set it in that uh subs.yaml file such that you don't have to worry about remembering the 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 arms of your keys the only thing that you have to remember is that you get into your repository you want to create a new file and you just do foo.dev.yaml and it automatically subs will pick up the keys that it needs in order to create that new file and that's it so with that i think that closes kind of uh, our quick overview of subs uh, there's a lot more you can do with it we have a really cool community of people they always come up with new ways to use subs uh, there are articles on how to use uh, Mozilla SOPs with Kubernetes uh, that you should check out. A lot of people have done some really good work on this. Um, I see KubeSec is using it, etc., etc. Uh, I like the article from Frederick here. It's a really good one. Um, oh, well, he removed it. <laughs> well, there is that. Frederick, put back your article. It was a good one. Uh, using secrets like a boss, this one uses SOPs as well. Um, so very good community, really long readme. Uh, please contribute to it. T tell us what you need, uh, how you use the tool, uh, what you would like to see in it, etc. And in the future, I'll try to talk a little more about some advanced topics and how we use SOPs with something called SOPs Workspace. Uh, and we do some pretty fancy stuff there that is very specific to our environment that I can't really get into here because it wouldn't be super meaningful. But anyway, uh, let us know what uh, what you would like to see in this project and uh, and don't hesitate to, to create issues and everything. And, um, I think that is it for this week uh, and uh, in the next couple of weeks I haven't quite picked a topic yet so I'll let you know on Twitter when I have a good idea otherwise feel free to uh, submit a topic that you would like to see and as always if you're more interested in these topics feel free to reach out grab a copy of the book if you want to support uh, the work we're doing here and I'll see you very soon.